Coming up on American Black Journal with inflation and poverty on the rise, the new CEO of Forgotten Harvest is here to talk about feeding those in need this summer. Plus, we'll talk about the quest for reparations for past discrimination against Black Detroiters. Don't go anywhere. American Black Journal starts right now. From Delta faucets to bear paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Elsa Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit PBS. DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit PBS. Among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving, we support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Learn more at dtefoundation.com. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation. And viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. Rising prices and economic disparities are making it really hard for many families to put food on the table. According to Feed America, one in five children in Southeast Michigan face hunger and food insecurity increases during the summer when kids are not getting regular meals at school. The local nonprofit Forgotten Harvest is making sure families have access to fresh, nutritious food through its summer feeding program and other initiatives. I spoke with the organization's new CEO, Adrian Lewis. Uh, it's really great to have you here. Uh, Forgotten Harvest is such an important institution in our community. Uh, I love that you are its new leader. Um, let's talk about the things that uh, you're confronting uh, as you take over there at, uh, at Forgotten Harvest. Um, uh, we want to talk more specifically about summer and how different that is but uh but give us an overall picture of, of the organization yeah. and the challenges absolutely well um you know forgotten harvest uh over the almost 35 years of its existence has always been about closing that gap on uh food insecurity and hunger throughout metro detroit that has not changed uh and uh, as we um begin to now better leverage our new facility we are truly doing that, Stephen, uh, and that's really um, fortunate in a sense that you know we're able to do it because we're seeing a thirty percent increase in demand for our services. So, mm -hmm. being able to do that is it's, it's definitely a plus. But obviously, we want to make sure that we're being very specific and concise on where we're you know addressing that need. Yeah, let's talk about that new facility. That's been a long time coming. Uh, yeah. What's the advantage to the organization of having that facility and, and how, how much uh, better that makes the, the services that, uh, that you provide? Absolutely. Um, you know, the facility itself is about 78,000, I'll call it 80,000 square feet. And to be able to not only have the extra capacity to hold uh, food goods, but we're now able to really be creative in how we distribute it, especially from an equitable uh, perspective and mm -hmm. making sure that we're getting things sorted uh, so that we can reach all of our 260 distribution sites uh, in a timely manner. And that focus is all about getting the right food right to the right place in the right quantity in the right time, because uh, that's essential. We will not ever uh, have any intentions on making sure that, you know, the, the goods are still fresh, the goods are still um, you know, getting to the right place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, 650 sites. Uh, that's such a, an incredible number. <laughs> Talk about uh, that yeah. work of, of delivery and, and how widespread it is, how, how many different parts of this community you reach with that. Yes. Um, you know, we're able to, again, we're, we're we primarily services the, the, the tri-county area and to have our distribution partners strategically positioned. Uh, and, and we use a lot of great data to determine that, Stephen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we try our best to make sure that we're not overlapping and we're truly reaching 
new points of access. Uh, and to have those partners, we wouldn't be able to do it without them uh, yeah. to do that. But those partners come in many ways, right? We, we have to have the distribution partners, but we also have to have the donating food partners mm -hmm. in which um, we have great relationships with all of the major retailers, as well as the manufacturers and distribution centers that are throughout. And that's the great, uh, that's the great point in this. I, and I call it the magical collaboration. And um, I, I know we don't have much time, but one of these days I'll tell you my stone soup uh, story. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's what we're making here. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's an honor to lead this, this, this grand mission. And it means so much to me as well as to you. I, I yeah. know. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about summer uh, okay. and what summer means for hunger in this community, and therefore what it means for Forgotten Harvest. Things look a little different than they do other parts of the year. Yeah. Um, you know, if we look at the vulnerable populations of our children, uh, as well as our seniors, right? If we look at just those two, and there's probably a, a few others I could easily name, but summer feeding is, has definitely been a focus. Um, uh, you know, we have at over 10 sites that we're doing summer feeding at, but being able to definitely keep the youth nourished as well as uh, involved during the summer months. Uh, but also for our seniors, we're partnering with, um, you know, Amazon, DoorDash to be able to do deliveries throughout the summer. Uh, many of our seniors aren't able to get out, as you would imagine. So we're identifying those individuals that we can help and assist. Uh, and it's all about choice, right? I mean, mo many of our distributions are a matter of, you know, you, you'll see those already predetermined amounts that we're giving to our, to our neighbors in need. Uh, but we are now working on our, on our client choice market in which uh, we will have the ability to have our, our neighbors to come in and shop just like a grocery store mm -hmm. uh, in which, you know, it's not a new concept, but it is new and exciting for us to be able to roll out into the community. Uh, and we're going to also have at least four mobile units uh, yeah. with that capability. Yeah. Um, exciting stuff. Yeah, no, it is. Uh, I, I want to talk a little about um, the, the kind of the nature of hunger um, and the transitory nature of it uh, and, and how you manage that. I mean, I think when, when uh, often when people think of poverty, if they think of housing instability, if they think of hunger, they think of it as something that's ongoing for everyone. Uh, and that it's always the same group of people who have the same needs and challenges. But of course, it's way more complicated than that. And, and it seems like it gets more complicated uh, over time um, that, that, uh, needs pop up uh, because of circumstances. So, so how do you manage that with with something like Forgotten Harvest to make sure, as you say, that you're meeting the needs when they when they arrive? Yeah, you know um, that's a very good point there, Stephen. And and the best way I would describe it is by having such a mission with dedicated uh, members of that mission, but more so being a listening ear to the community mm -hmm. and those partners that we utilize, whether it be our donors or our distribution points, uh, we have close relationships with those individuals. And we're able to hear firsthand in, in many instances as to if a need were to shift in a certain area. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, a real interesting um, stat for you is the average person that utilizes our services it's, it's, of course, there's some anomalies, but on an average of about five times a year. So what does that tell us, right? Uh, it tells us that, you know, anyone can have a bad bad day or bad, mm -hmm. bad week. It's mm -hmm. not always that stereotype of what hunger has looked like in the past or, yeah. or uh, what food insecurity may look like. And uh, as we look at all three counties, there's not a county that that that, 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 that does not exist in. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, it's really, really interesting. And we're really uh, grateful to be able to have the partners in collaboration to be able to do that free of charge. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I also wonder what you're seeing in terms of the need uh, in our community and whether it is more acute right now um, because of, you know, some of the things that, that we're dealing with in the general economy. Or, in fact, whether maybe they're not as acute. I mean, uh, we keep hearing stats about the 
falling numbers of children in poverty because of things like the the federal tax credit and and some other measures. But but I wonder what that looks like from from you as a provider. Yeah, it, it definitely uh, what we're seeing it, it definitely aligns uh, with uh, the high inflation of food, right? Mm. It definitely yeah. aligns with that. It yeah. definitely shifted as the tax credits were uh, exhausted, so yeah. to speak. Right. Uh, so that definitely aligned. But you know what was really interesting post pandemic, as I would say, is that many uh, of our family. Of, of our of our neighbors in need or neighbors in general were just made more aware of that dignity and respect that we're providing as a service that they're not ashamed to share that they're not a you know they're not a that they're sharing more about the awareness with other neighbors so i believe that also has an uptick in mm -hmm. the use of our services that you know may or may not have been there in the past yeah yeah. Okay, uh, Adrian Lewis, uh, great to have you at the helm there at the Forgotten Harvest and wonderful to have you here with us on American Black Journal. Thanks so much for joining. And again, thank you for having, uh, having me and I look forward to uh, connecting in the future. Thank you again. So American Black Journal teamed up with Bridge Detroit recently for a virtual town hall that was titled Making Amends the quest for reparations. Our panel of guests talked about the work of the Detroit Reparations Task Force, the history of discrimination against Black Detroiters, and reparations efforts in other cities. Here are some clips from that town hall meeting. Joining me now to talk about the work that this task force has been doing are the co-chairs of it, Keith Williams and Sydney Calloway. Welcome, Keith and Sydney, uh, to our town hall. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Uh, it's great to see both of you. Uh, Keith, I'm going to start with you. You and I have had a, several conversations about this task force since it started. Uh, like I said, uh, you guys uh, started out last year. Uh, we're a year or more into this now. Catch us up. Where are we with the monumental effort, really, uh, that you guys have to undertake to, to just start figuring out what the scope of this issue is? You know, almost started like this. Weeping man endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Last year, when me and you talked, we was going through some difficult periods, but I think we're now on track. Uh, when Robert Simmons came to Detroit last year, yeah, we were for trying to find our way, but Robin got us on track about where do we need to go, and that was like from uh, to start with a harm report, then then and then. Uh, kind of, then after that, uh, we got involved with University of Michigan, and University of Michigan was doing the harm report. And then after that, with my relationship with um, with the the regional aspect of Robert Wood Simmons uh, uh, um, Municipal Reparations, she t I met Linda uh, Linda Mann some years ago, and she she came in and uh, she uh, she did the uh, what we call the impact report. We got the harm report. And the impact report, and so you know, they're really we're really trying to get on track to get this report done by October. Sydney has been really doing a good, fabulous job doing in the inner workings of it. I'm just looking at the big picture, and Sydney can elaborate a little bit more on the internal aspect of it. But I think we're well on our way to getting this report done. So, so before I get to Sydney, Keith, what happens after October? Let's say. Uh, it's November 2024. What should Detroiters expect will be happening at that point? Well, our, our focus should be on what the, the ballot initiative stated, make recommendations on housing and economic development. We, you'll, when this report is all said and done, it should have met those criteria. Yes, we added some other stuff to it because the cultural aspect was destroyed uh, during the, uh, those years. Uh, from 1929 to up until when Motown left, then you got to look at the at the healthcare aspect. My brother died in 1961 in our house because uh, he didn't have proper health care. He died of measles and pneumonia, mm -hmm. and we couldn't get access to the proper authority healthcare professionals to help us with that situation. Just imagine all the families surrounded with your dad, mom, and the baby's holding the, is held in your mother's arms, and he's dying in front of us. And then I can go back to 1960, as my father told me, four of his sisters died 
in a house in Hamtramck because of tuberculosis. So you got to add all those things and come up with a comprehensive report that's going to be sellable. We've got to be able to sell this to all the people because you got skeptics out here that, you know, it's a handout, as you heard in the uh, in the previous interview. But we got to make it that it can't be too far to the left or too far to the right. It's got to be pragmatic and sellable to the to the Detroiters who voted for this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sydney, uh, this is the first time you and I are, are, are talking about this. You're relatively new to the task force. First thing I want to do is give you a chance to to introduce yourself, talk a little about uh, your background. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. Henderson. My name is Sydney Calloway. I'm a native Detroiter born and raised here on the West Side. Um, I am a fellow or I was a former fellow with the Movement for Black Lives two times over. So for two seasons, I got to learn on a national scale with the Movement for Black Lives. I've been an activist since 2020. Um, and this has been a phenomenal opportunity for a knowledge exchange. There's a lot of wisdom on this task force. There's a lot of history that's being shared and I'm learning a lot. Um, I never uh, thought that I would be in any type of leader, leadership position um, Never thought I'd be end, end up being the co-chair, but I'm um, very privileged and honored to be with this team and very excited about this work. So, so let's talk about this goal of recommending housing and economic development programs that would uh, boost opportunities for Black Detroiters. Talk about, Sydney, what you guys have found so far and especially what you're hearing uh, from the public. Yeah, so um, we've been having some really phenomenal internal meetings as of late, and um, we're starting to work on the outline for our report. So we want to make sure that this report not only goes to city council, but that it's something that can be consumed by the residents and make sure that they're informed, um, they know what type of programs we're working on. We are going to be releasing quite a few um, surveys over the next couple of months to really engage with our community to make sure that they have an opportunity to um, engage and give their input to make sure that their voices are amplified in this process. Um, we've gotten a report back from Columbia University speaking to quite a few different things that they observed while they were here. It was fantastic to have them here in person, allowing them to visit some of these sites of harm and really put some tangible pieces um, to the, the, the research that they were doing. I'm very excited about the U of M report to come out, but we really want to um, center the voices of the residents, give them an opportunity to, an opportunity to um, give us some feedback and to really help drive the way that this work is going to go um, because the 13 of us can't do it alone. We're working in a beautiful black city and we need to make sure that every voice is amplified. Um, so that's that's where we're at right now. We're working, we're working on our outline for the framework, talking about um, feasibility, sustainability, um, not even just for housing and education, affordable quality housing, because we have to insert that word quality there. Um, mm -hmm. But we're looking for a holistic approach. So we heard um, some commentators or some comments saying that, you know, there's a little bit of skepticism, um, that if they don't have an education piece to it, that it's kind of, it feels like it's for naught. It feels like this is all in vain. But we want to make sure that there's some type of mention to um, some systemic change, some policy change. So we got a lot on our plate, but it's very exciting to get into this work with everyone. The University of Michigan has partnered with the Detroit Reparations Task Force to provide research on reparative justice here in Southeast Michigan. Joining me now is Rita Chen. She's an associate dean at the University of Michigan, in the graduate programs there. She brought together university faculty members for this coordinated effort. Rita, welcome to the town hall. Thank you so much for having me. So let's start here. Explain how U of M's partnership with the task force came to be and what some of the goals are. Okay, well, um, as, as many of you probably know, the University of Michigan is a pretty uh, big and unwieldy institution. And so um, there are actually a number of different units who are participating in this partnership with the task force. Um, Rackham, the graduate school, is one partner. Um, but, but there are two others that I, I think are worth uh, sort of calling out here. The first is the Center for so Social Solutions, which is directed by Dr. Earl Lewis. And that um, center actually began three or four years ago already um, in partnership with Lauren Hood and her Afrofuturism kind of project to, to think about reparations specifically um, in relation to Black Bottom and the prospect of uh, the resurfacing of I-375. Um, so that was a kind of seed. And then as the task force 
um, got up and running. Lauren was actually initially one of the, the co-chairs of the task force. And so she sort of brought the Center for Social Solutions um, and myself into conversation with the task force, um, thinking about sort of how we might uh, be, begin to address some of these research questions, right? Because it's one thing to sort of know uh, the, the kind of um, sort of newspaper or media level um, have that kind of understanding of um, the harms that have been done. But in order to actually make uh, a kind of substantive case for reparations, um, we knew that it was going to be important to have real kind of documentation on a number of fronts. Mm -hmm. um, so at the same time, one of the subcommittees for the Detroit Reparations Task Force reached out to another uh, U of M unit, that's Poverty Solutions, and asked them to begin to write a, a, a harms report that was focused on housing. And so the three U of M units have actually been coordinated in trying to um, bring together uh, a kind of more holistic, as Keith was talking about and, and Sydney were talking about, um, view of, of what the harms experienced by Black Detroiters have been. And so my, my role in that was really convening a group of uh, different faculty experts. So political scientists, historians, um, urban planners, um, social work experts, public health experts. Um, now we have someone on the team who, who is focused on education, public policy, um, and also climate science, right? Because we found that actually um, so much of the harm that has been done to Black Detroiters um, that, is, that we typically associate with housing is actually um, connected to environmental hazards like air quality, um, flood risk, which um, you know, can lead to health problems around Black mold. Um, and then those impact things like education and how often students miss school because of all of these other kinds of health issues. Um, and so we started to find as we were um, kind of unpacking different uh, disciplinary perspectives that they're very much connected and that housing is in many ways the kind of spine yeah. of um, the harm, but it seemed important to also tease out all of these other implications, ramifications, consequences, and present those in this harms report to the task force um, so that they have kind of maximal information. Recently, we saw Chicago's mayor announce that he is going to order the creation of a reparations task force to examine policies in that city that have harmed African Americans. Uh, give us a sense of what you've learned, Malachi, about how other cities uh, are, are approaching this, and are there things that we should be looking to in some other places to guide our work here in Detroit? Yeah, I mean, we're like in a really interesting moment in history when it comes to uh, reparations in the United States of America. Uh, for a long time, the pressure was put on Congress. Uh, our longtime Detroit uh, Congressman John Conyers had uh, been pushing for a, a commission at the federal level. Well, in kind of a response to the lack of progress, there are a lot of cities have begun taking this up and it really started with Evanston, Illinois, as we've mentioned, the suburb of Chicago. Um, they were the first city to create reparation proposals really based around its history of uh, racial segregation and housing, which is pretty mm -hmm. similar to what we've experienced in Detroit. And um, so they were kind of like the first mover, the, the, the first city to really show that this was possible. And we've really seen like an explosion uh, of cities and a couple of states around the country creating local task forces to, to look at, you know, what what have their governments been responsible for? A lot of them are in the similar position that Detroit is in. They have a task force assembled. Um, you know, they're starting to partner with researchers to come up with studies that will kind of inform their work, but they haven't necessarily put recommendations out. Um, in a few instances, um, there have been some proposals put forward, but it's not clear how it will be funded. Uh, you know, a California task force had talked about uh, including uh, cash payments, but that ended up being pulled off the table. Um, but but some pretty major, I mean, New York is working on something, uh, Boston, Knoxville, Tennessee, Philadelphia, that all have task forces. Kansas City created a reparations commission last year. Um, they're actually collecting donations. So there's a few different ways that cities are kind of trying to tackle the, the funding question and the legal constraint question. 
Evanston used marijuana tax revenue. We're a little bit limited in our ability to do that. We do get a portion of uh, marijuana taxes from the state, but it's really kind of too small uh, of an amount of funding to really, uh, I think, do what we'd like to do here. So we have to get kind of creative about that. And I think there will be questions for you know the the governor of Michigan and and state lawmakers about mm-hmm. what responsibility the state bears and if they're going to put it forward. But um, you know we're we're really just seeing a lot of cities uh, travel along a similar path, and and I think that creates partnerships too that. You know, the city's been of uh, Detroit's been working with Evanston, Illinois, and you know, we're all kind of on the same uh, trajectory here. And you can watch the entire Reparations Town Hall on demand at AmericanBlackJournal.org. It's also where you can learn more about our guests, plus connect with us anytime on social media. Take care, and we'll see you next time. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Elsa Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit PBS. DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit PBS. Among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving, we support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Learn more at dtefoundation.com. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation. And viewers like you. Thank you.